Bringing light out of the darkness. There is only one verse in God's Word of the 32,000 approximate verses in the Word of God. There's only one verse and one only that exegetically speaks in its context to the issue of translation. It's something God has only said once and has only seen a need to say once. That verse is Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8. When the Refugees came back from the Babylonian captivity. They left something in Babylon, their mother tongue. Except for the Levites and some old people, most Israelites, most of the people who came back from the captivity, could not speak Hebrew anymore. The Targumim, that is the translations into Aramaic in the Syriac text, had not been translated yet. The Septuagint, Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, did not exist yet. They had a big problem. One verse, and one verse only, does God speak to this issue of translation. This must be our point of commencement. The entire issue of translation must derive from what God has said concerning it. In Nehemiah 8.8, 8, we read the following. They read from the book, from the law of God, that is the Megillah Torah, the Pentateuch, translating to give the sense so they understood the reading. Translating to give the sense. This tells us two things. One, it tells us the priority is always on the original meaning of the original language. Not post-Elizabethan English. Not any other language. Not French, not Norwegian, not uh, Chinese. The priority is always on Hebrew, Aramaic, concerning portions of Daniel and so forth, and Greek. That is the priority. That's what God says. The priority is on the original meaning of the original languages. Second thing it tells us. They translated in such a way to give a sense to the meaning. There are very literal translations in English of the Greek and Hebrew scriptures, such as Young's Literal. They're very, very careful to be as literal as possible to the original languages. But they don't make much sense for reading or for study. Because language doesn't work that way. <coughs> English was influenced by a number of other languages, certainly Latin, German, and French after the Norman Conquest. I could say to somebody here in England where I am at the moment, well, I was encouraged to go to uh, the south of France for holiday, for vacation. I was encouraged by my friends to go to the south of France. If I was to be completely accurate in what encourage meant or means in French when it first came into English, I would have to say, my friends tried to put bravery into me to go on vacation to the, to the Riviera, to the south of France. Encourage means, etymologically, to put bravery into someone. Encourage. Now, colloquially, that's not the sense of the meaning. My friends encouraged me to go to the south of France for vacation. No. My friends urged me or tried to persuade me to go to the south of France. That's the sense of the meaning. 
the word encourage does not mean now what it originally meant. Well, Hebrew is the same. If I was to say from the Song of Solomon, Ani le do di ve do di li, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. In modern Hebrew, that means I am my uncle's and my uncle is mine. The priority is on the original language, but you must accurately translate the sense of the meaning, what it meant at that time. We have two basic models of translation. The more literalist approaches, like the New American Standard, and we have the more flexible approaches, which are known as dynamic equivalent. How would you say now what that meant then? Okay. Some people would say, oh, dynamic equivalence is wrong. We should stick to something very literal. The problem is the Holy Spirit disagreed. Most often, though not always, when the New Testament quotes from the Old, it quotes from not the Mesoretic Hebrew, or translating from the Mesoretic into Greek, it basically quotes from the Septuagint. And the Septuagint is a dynamic equivalent translation. It is not a highly literal one. In Leviticus 17, there is no forgiveness of sins without blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. That's quoted in the New Testament, but it's from the Septuagint. It doesn't exactly say it that way in the Hebrew. In fact, the rabbis will deny the need for blood sacrifice because it's not in the Mesoretic. But that's what it would have meant then. This is known as dynamic equivalence. When you translate from one language to another, two different people are going to translate accurately, but they may not use the same terminology. It's as much an art as it is a science. What we can say is, it is the original meaning that has the priority in the original language. And we must translate that idea, what the author was inspired to write then, in a way that people can understand it now. Now we do have a problem with paraphrases and with inclusivist Bibles. The only legitimacy for a paraphrase would either be a children's Bible, where children are learning to read until they are able to read well enough to get them into a proper translation. Or in certain mission situations where you're trying to get people saved who don't have a written language yet, something the Wycliffe translators and others and Bible societies have had to cope with in the developing world very often. As a temporary provision for children's Bibles or in certain missiological situations where the people don't have the scripture in their own language yet, there can be a temporary need for a good paraphrase. But otherwise, paraphrases are bad. Things like the message are rubbish. And Eugene Peterson's book is absolutely abominable. That is John Wimber's uh, Bible of Choice. It is absolutely disgusting. It has no resemblance very often to the original meaning of the original Greek in the New Testament. Very often it has no resemblance to it. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. In Greek, the word, the logos, becomes sarx. Jesus is God who become a man and dwell among us. With that word dwell, katastino, is the Greek translation of tabernacled. The same God who was present with the Old Testament Israelites in the tabernacle would now become incarnated in the person of Jesus. That's the original meaning of the original Greek in John 1, verse 14. Rick Warren's theological mentor, Eugene Peterson, comes along with the, the message, or whatever he calls it, and he writes, the word became flesh and moved into our neighborhood. That's what it says. This is completely stupid. It's not just wrong, it's stupid. We have inclusive versions now. We have to be gender neutral. We have to edit out or delete or redact anything that is critical of homosexuality or divorce. 
this is terrible. No, we must stick to the priority of the original languages and the original meaning. Be careful of the ignorant babblers from the King James only camp. These people are ignorant babblers. Now, I'm not speaking against the King James Bible. It is a valid translation that God has used. There are many good things to say about it. I'm not speaking against the King James Version. I'm not speaking against it. But King James himself was widely alleged by almost every historian to have been a homosexual in an inappropriate relationship with a young guy. King James persecuted born-again believers. Why did the pilgrims come on the Mayflower to Massachusetts? Because they were being persecuted for their faith by King James. He was the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, in the 1611 edition of the King James Bible. It cites Apocrypha and it, as, as, as if it were canonical, and it also lists Roman Catholic holy days to Mary and things like this, the Feast of the Annunciation and so forth. I was with somebody who was archly, uh, he was adamantly King James only, that it was the only right one, and I was going through different passages, and I said, read this from the Psalms, <clears throat> and I read, Imani Yishkehek Yerushalayim, Tishi Hechnemani, I said, what does it say in the King James? If I forget the O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its cunning. I said, that's not it. That's not what it says. That's not what it means. Well, the meaning's implied. No, it's not. It simply says, if I forget the O Jerusalem, may I forget my right hand. And when you look at this thematically, and when you look at this, Co-textually, the right hand of Yahweh is Jesus, the Messiah. He will bring salvation with his right hand. If God can forget Jerusalem and his promises to the Israelites concerning Jerusalem, it means he can forget his own son, Jesus. That's what it actually means. Oh, no, the King James says he was putting the King James in priority over the original meaning of the original language. King James says Easter. Jesus did not raise from the dead on Easter. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and 1 Corinthians all say he rose on the Hebrew feast of first fruits, Yom Rishon of Hag Matzot. Oh no, it says Easter in the King James. I don't care what it says in the King James. I care what it says in Greek. I care what the apostles wrote. These are silly, ignorant people. When you talk to them, you'll find that very few of them can read Greek or Hebrew themselves. They don't even know that the King James, many of them, is not a translation, but it's a translation of a translation. The Textus Receptus was fused together by Erasmus of Rotterdam from four earlier Byzantine manuscripts. It's not a source manuscript. These people are way out of their league. They are not scholars. They are not academics. But they pretend to have academic or scholarly knowledge, which they don't have, and they certainly don't have linguistic knowledge. They're silly, ignorant people. They should just be ignored. They're not worth paying any attention to. Having said that, there is nothing wrong with the King James, although, like any other good translation, it is not perfect. And it does contain errors. It even calls the Holy Spirit an it. Now that's a Jehovah's Witness doctrine. That the Holy Spirit is a nominate. It's not a person. He, he is not a person. That's a Jehovah's Witness false teaching. Supported by the King James. Because the King James does not translate it very well. There are mistakes in it. Let no one tell you there aren't. It was put together by the nonconformist scholars under King James meeting with the established church, the Anglo-Catholic scholars. Now, they did a fantastic job. It was very important in the construction of the English language as we have seen it evolve over the centuries. It's highly poetic, and it, 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 very often the King James, in fact, most of the time, it's quite accurate. It is a valid translation. 
and God has certainly used it. I have no problem with the King James Bible. King James was not a very nice man, but the King James Bible had no problem with it. But it's not without error, and it is not, it is absolutely not the priority. Nehemiah 8.8 8 says the priority is the original meaning of the original languages. Now, what translation do I use? I have an advantage. When I study God's word, I read Greek and Hebrew. Not everybody can. Fortunately for me, I'm able to handle the Greek and Hebrew. I read Greek. I read Hebrew. I speak Hebrew. Uh, I can do that. I don't rely on any translation of God's word. I just read God's word. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday I was studying from the Septuagint and from the Keter Yerushalayim, from the original Hebrew. I had a Hebrew text, a Hebrew uh, codex, without a word of English or any other language in it. Everything was ancient Hebrew. And I was, I was reading it yesterday. Uh, Daniel, I studied Daniel 12 yesterday in both the Septuagint and in the, uh, the original Hebrew. Um, that's the priority. That's where the priority needs to be, not on any translation. Now, again, the King James I do consider to be a valid translation, despite its language being archaic. It creates problems in both evangelism and discipleship. And evangelism, verily, verily, I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Go down to East London and speak to the Cockneys and say, verily, verily, I say to thee. Hey, right, mate, you're right, not. Nah. In other words, they say you were crazy. People don't know what that means anymore. The idea is to give the sense of the original meaning that people can understand it. So if you say, truly, truly, I say to you, you must be born again, they'd understand somehow what that means. Or at least they'd understand what the language means. Likewise, in discipling young believers from working class backgrounds or people who are not formally educated, it's very difficult to plunge them into this archaic language of the 17th century and try to teach them God's word in a dialect of English they don't speak anymore. It's quite ridiculous almost. Now again, this is not to demean the King James. I have it. I read it. I sometimes read it devotionally. I love it for its prose. It's a valid translation and God has used it. But the priority is always on the original meaning of the original languages. Now we can go further with this, talking about which manuscripts are the best, but that's not the question, and it's a very technical, technical area uh, of expertise. Thank you so much. Next question, please. Remember, it was the Roman Catholic Church who took Jerome's Vulgate, the Latin Bible, which was not a very good translation, and <clears throat> alienated people from the Word of God with this language that they could not understand. Those who get into the King James only school of thought begin doing the same thing. You're making the Word of God less understandable. Although I would say, of course, that the King James is a valid translation, while the Vulgate is not a very good one. But the Vulgate of Jerome, the Latin Bible, is the Bible of the Roman Catholic Church, was the Bible of choice of John Calvin. Some people try to say that the King James is the Reformation Bible. This is silly. It was a hundred years after Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral that the King James was first published in 1611. It was nearly a hundred years later. The Bible that triggered, ignited the Reformation was the New Testament of Erasmus of Rotterdam. Now, King James didn't exist then. It was an English translation of it that came later, and even then, it, it, it took quite a bit of revision. There, there were multiple editions of it. When the Pilgrim Fathers came to America, they didn't want the King James because King James persecuted them. They took Calvin's Geneva Bible, the Bible of the 
Pilgrim Fathers who came to America and of the nonconformists in England, it wasn't the King James, it was the Geneva Bible. They didn't want the King James. King James was semi-Catholic to them. He was their persecutor. When you read what secular historians like Winston Churchill in his epic classic, The History of the English-Speaking People, read what Churchill and other historians said about King James. He was not a positive figure in British history. Well, let's go even further with this now. What translations are good? There are good ones and bad ones, but there are no perfect ones. We can rely on the Word of God as it is in Nehemiah 8.8. 8. The original autographs are inspired. The closer something is to the original meaning of the original language, the better it is. The New American Standard is a valid translation. The New English Version, NEV, not NIV, but NEV, is a very good translation. Because a version will highlight something, or italicize something, or footnote something with a number, and will say, not all manuscripts can contain this verse. That does not mean that it's omitting those verses. It's simply trying to be faithful to the manuscript record that we have. But the King James ignoramuses will say, see, it takes it out of the Word of God. No, it doesn't. It simply italicizes it and footnotes it, saying not all manuscripts contain it, or that it's only in the Dead Sea Scrolls or something of that nature. But they have two standards. There are plenty of things that are italicized in the King James, that the King James interpolates. Again, the King James only people are generally ignorant. And the only thing worse than an ignorant person who pretends he knows something that he doesn't is when they become so adamant about it and so absurd that even when you show them from the original languages that's not what it means, they will still hold on to it. This is ridiculous. These people... These are people of low intelligence or something. I don't know what's wrong with them. There's obviously a spiritual pride. When you show them, this is not in the Texas Receptus. This is not even in the Masoretic. If King James gets it wrong, they'll go with the King James. There was one heretic. Now on his third mar marriage, Peter Ruckman, who's, who's a white supremacist. He's a racist. He actually, from the pulpit, has referred to black people as niggers. He's a racist. He actually used that word in church from a pulpit, talking about black people, and there are black believers. Peter Ruckman, again on his third marriage, I was listening to his tape trying to justify his multiple divorces and remarriage. And he said, at no time will I refer to the original Greek or Hebrew for the simple reason that when someone deviates from the King James, they go into error. <laughs> He's in the error. He's in the immoral living based on his error. Which you can only somehow get from twisting the scriptures. But that's what he does. Yet he's a hero to some of the King James only people. Peter Ruckman said that additions to the King James Bible not found in the original Greek and Hebrew. And he admits there are things in the King James that are not in the original manuscripts are further revelation. In other words, in 1611, Jesus gave further revelation. However, at the end of the book of Revelation, Jesus said, that's it, it's finished, it's closed. Don't anybody add anything to this. <laughs> well, the Ruckmanites, the King James only Ruckmanites, they're doing what the Mormons did and what the Muslims do. They added another testament. The Mormons say the Book of Mormon is the third testament. The Muslims say the Quran is the third testament. Peter Ruckman's King James only people are doing the same thing. They're saying things not found in the original Greek and Hebrew that were added by the 1611 edition of the King James are further revelation. This is a heretical statement. Yet, there's people who follow this nonsense. Ignorance is one thing, but once you instruct an ignorant person and they still prefer their ignorance, don't even waste your time talking to people like that. Again, I respect the King James. I respect the fact that many of its source manuscripts
came from godly men like William Tyndale. I respect the legacy and tradition of Mr. Coverdale. I'm not putting the King James translation down at all. It is a valid translation. Although it has problems and errors, it is a valid translation. But King James onlyism is utter nonsense. The only thing more silly than King James only are the people who believe it and promote it. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless and thank you. Not surprisingly, it was a woman called Edwina Curry, who had been a member of the British cabinet and a member of the British parliament, who was fired for incompetence as health minister. It was widely reported in the British press that she had an extramarital affair with former prime minister John Major. Anyway, she was fired for incompetence as a health minister, so she began writing a book about sex scandals in Parliament. She had a, a, a story, a, 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 almost a, a fiction, um, or a docu-fiction, a fiction based on what really goes on in the immoral corridors of power of Great Britain. Uh, Congress would be no different, I assure you, or any other government. Nonetheless, this was at Weena Curry, and her signature piece of legislation was to reduce the age of homosexual consent to 16. So a 45 or 55-year-old homosexual male could seduce a 16-year-old boy from a family where he had no father figure, an absent father, he was vulnerable, he was having gender identity issues in early adolescence, and by the age of 16 he was ripe for the picking. Mrs. Curry wanted to do that, Edwina Curry. And she was a conservative, a Tory. Um, there's no more conservative party in Great Britain since Margaret Thatcher. The traditional conservative party, unfortunately, no longer exists. Nonetheless, there may be individuals who are conservative, but the party as a conservative party is not there. This was in Great Britain. Well, over the years, if something happens in Britain, it tends to happen in America. Homosexuality was decriminalized in Britain before it was in the United States. The precedent was set. Uh, we've had members of the U.S. Supreme Court, justices, citing foreign precedent and foreign juridical decisions and guiding their own decision in order to basically rewrite the Constitution away from the intent of the Founding Fathers. One of the most wicked and despicable people who's ever done this, a wicked, wicked woman, was Ronald Reagan's appointee to the U.S. Supreme Court, Sandra Day O'Connor. She outlawed the Kansas sodomy laws, and she was a pro-abortion judge who Ronald Reagan appointed to be Supreme Court Justice after he lied to Christian America saying he was pro-life. He appointed this woman who was pro-death, pro-abortion, and she wrote that decision on the Texas anti-sodomy laws, which opened the door for same-sex marriage nationally, an avalanche of it. It was also Sandra Day O'Connor who wrote the court's decision on outlawing the Ten Commandments from the Judiciary Building in Alabama. She's a wicked, wicked woman. How a woman like that would ever become a Christian and not go to hell? Well, the Lord can save her, but it's not likely. She's a wicked, wicked woman. She's a true daughter of Satan. And uh, a pet, political pet of Ronald Reagan. It shows you what Reagan really was, just a politician. Um, he just lied through his teeth about this very issue of abortion, but then it became homosexuality with his appointees. That judge in California, Republican homosexual judge, who outlawed Proposition 8 against the democratic will of the people of the state of California, he was nominated to the bench by Ronald Reagan and appointed by George Bush. So it's not something just coming from the political left or people like the Clintons or Obama or people who you would think. In both Britain and America, it's come from people falsely pretending to be conservative. The Republican Party in the United States, uh, certainly the Bushes and Reagan, and also uh, the so-called Tory or Conservative Party in Great Britain. Nations get the leaders they deserve. They also get the pastors and preachers and theologians they deserve. The reason you have that kind of people in government is because that's the kind of people you're getting increasingly in the church. People like Tony Campola or Steve Chalk in Britain caving in on the homosexuality issue 
and going for the youth. If you speak to a homosexual male who's been or a lesbian who's been saved, who was born again and the Lord delivered them from that, and you listen to their testimony, almost inevitably, I would just about say just about inevitably, there may be the very odd exception, but I never heard of an exception. They all have the same kind of testimony. They had an absent or missing father figure, or a lesbian, an absent or missing mother figure. Mommy became daddy, and daddy became mommy, and as they came into early adolescence, they had a confused identity issue. That is what what, what happened to them. Um, and they're vulnerable at that particular age. Hence, at the age of vulnerability is the age of primary seduction. You want to get to them when they're as young as possible to get them into that lifestyle. And that is what is happening. Now, when the world does it, I expect it. When, when a politician like Ronald Reagan lies, I wouldn't expect Ronald Reagan, if had he been alive, to do anything other than lie. He's a politician. You know, he, he, was, he was a grade B Hollywood actor who co-starred to a monkey, uh, who was hired by the Republican Party establishment to play the role of a conservative. That's all he was. He was no conservative. And he was certainly no social conservative. He appointed O'Connor. He appointed that judge in California. He did a lot of things like that. Uh, again, these are politicians. They, they, when politicians lie, they do what you expect politicians to do. Politicians lie like dancers dance. That's what they do. It's their job. But when it gets into the church, we have an issue. When it gets into the body of Christ, we have a serious, serious issue. Now you have believers wanting to lower the age of consent and others just refusing to speak about it. One of the most deviously sick and twisted so-called pastors in the world, Lynn <coughs> of Hillsong, he's as deranged as the Houstons are in Australia. Lynn refused to speak to the homosexuality issue. And the way he perverted scripture out of context to justify not speaking to it was sickening. Now he, he, hosted that fiasco where Jesus came out in female drag uh, dressed as the Statue of Liberty where instead of a crown of thorns he had the crown of Lady Liberty, came out like Lady Liberty and they were singing New York, New York to him. And then they had the naked cowboy with cowboy boots, a cowboy hat and a big guitar dancing on the stage and, and a couple of thousand of Christian women clapping. And then the naked cowboy, the role was played by the church at Carl Lynn's youth minister. And uh, Bobby Houston, of course, was the keynote speaker. This, this is the kind of sick perversion you have in Hillsong. Hillsong is typical of the way that this whole thing is going uh, with the homosexuality at Al and all the rest of it. Uh, yes, I would again point you to our recording entitled, Not Even a Minyan, Not Even a Minyan. When I saw this coming, the Lord told me to begin to ex expound on this issue from the story of Lot in Genesis and how it foreshadows the rapture and resurrection and the coming rescue and how homosexuality will attempt and to a degree succeed to become increasingly militant and how Christians will begin to compromise with it the way Lot tried to get comfortable and coexist with it. It's on the recording, it's on the uh, YouTube, I believe. I would encourage you to watch it or listen to it. Now, in various of our teachings, we talked about how the morally debased cultural climate of the Greco-Roman Empire faced by the apostles and the early church in the first, second, and third centuries is going to be replayed eschatologically at the end of the world. Most of the Roman emperors were bisexual or homosexual. Claudius was a homosexual. Most, like like Caligula and so forth, were bisexual, particularly the ones who persecuted Christians. Well, you're going to see this happening. A homosexual and bisexual influence of the government that's going to hate Christians and persecute Christians, like in the early church. This is going to happen. It already began to happen with Barack Obama, Satan's son, Barack Obama. That's where it began. The pressure on um, evangelical chaplains in the military and so forth. I mean, he, he, Again, Romans 1 tells us that people like Obama and Clinton, who literally endorsed this, it's not only the 
people given over to sexual depravity. Paul writes, it's those who give hearty approval to what they do who are going to be given over to this divine judgment. Well, you already see this with, 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 with certain politicians like Obama. Obama actually sent letters to every school on the White House letterhead in the United States threatening to withhold federal funding if they didn't allow same-sex lavatories and, and, and locker room facilities and so forth. Just a wicked, wicked man. How that man will not go to hell? Again, it's almost impossible for someone like Barack Obama not to go to hell. Uh, of course, God balks at his, his, his enemies. He balks at people like Obama, but they do their damage under the hand of Satan. Well, that's only the foreshadow of it. Homosexuals, under the guidance of Satan, will attempt to make this worse, get more influence in government like happened in the first century, and then go after Christians. Uh, that's one example. Also, violence as entertainment is another. Not violence where you have people fighting in a cause, but just violence for the sake of violence, as the Romans had with the gladiators. Well, today, again, these computer games and so forth, virtual killing, uh, it's only there to celebrate violence, not for any cause or whatever, or even uh, maybe in a sensible cause. But it's going to become that kind of cultural environment that will be morally debased. Uh, and where human life will mean nothing, and there will be a hatred of Christians, and an increase in homosexuality, lesbianism, and bisexuality. It will become like the early church. Historically, we have teachings explaining this, one of which is the original series on preparing for persecution. Another aspect of this is the historian Arnold Toynbee. Arnold Toynbee was truly one of the great historians of human history. And Toynbee wrote one of the signs of a civilization in decline is the proliferation of homosexuality. Historically, that's always been a sign of the decline of any society. Well, by that criteria, Western civilization is certainly in decline. Again, we need to pray for our government, and we need to pray for our church leaders, and we need to pray that the church will be prepared for coming persecution. But there will be a rescue. There will be a rapture. But things will get worse before they get better. Don't believe the preacher of people. Thank you so much for your question. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless. Blessings to your friends. Greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kendall and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon and they're available through Kendall. Kendall. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being the Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo, Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture. 
the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available in the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you. We've dealt with this subject before in books such as Shadow of the Beast and also The Dilemma of Laodicea, if you want a more exhaustive consideration of, of these issues. Social engineering is not a modern phenomenon, nor an American or a Western phenomenon. It went back to the Roman Empire, when the Roman Empire would use a hyper-obsession with the Olympics and sports to, dilute, to uh, divert people away from social issues, or when they would uh, propagate violence as entertainment in the Olympics, again to divert people's attention away from their own plight economically and socially and so forth, as well as huge pagan idolatrous religious festivities. Social engineering and manipulation have always been around. What we've explained in various of our teachings is the phenomena of the zeitgeist, the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. The apostate church will always in some way follow the zeitgeist. In the post-Nicene era, commencing particularly with Augustine of Hippo and those who influenced him and those who were influenced by him, after Constantine pseudo-Christianized the Roman Empire, it was a platonic worldview. That was the zeitgeist, Platonism. Well, Augustine led the way into rewriting Christianity as a Platonic religion. In the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance, the zeitgeist saw a resurgence of Aristotelian religion. Hence, Thomas Aquinas wrote the Summa Theologia as Rambam wrote the Guide for the Perplexed. They were imitating what had already taken place in philosophical Islam. This was the zeitgeist. Aristotelianism, medieval scholasticism. That was the zeitgeist. In the 19th century, it was 19th century German rationalism. Liberal higher criticism, people like Rudolf Bultmann, Councilman, Perens, Mowinkel, these others, they came along with Darwinistic presupposition and began misinterpreting the scriptures Darwinistically following the zeitgeist. This gave us higher criticism. 19th century German rationalism, philosophically. What beget people like, like, like uh, Hegel and, and, and Nietzsche, and, 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 and beginning actually with, with Immanuel Kant, with the a priori and the categorical imperative. These things became something that swallowed up popular theology and scholarship. Uh, what had been traditional conservative Protestantism and things like pietism, and uh, the Moravian movements in Germany and things like this became replaced by higher critical presupposition that came out of Tübingen, Germany, and Germany, and so forth. And as a result of this, biblical Protestantism declined, and eventually the Germans just went back to their Teutonic war gods' ways with the rise of the Third Reich. This was the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. Liberation theology of people like Desmond Tutu uh, just follows the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age, uh, where morality is defined not in terms of the biblical guidelines of morality, but in terms of one's position on social issues politically. So, therefore, you can have children born out of wedlock, you can have an astronomical divorce where they run away homosexuality, but it's not politically correct to address those issues. We have to address income in, in inequality only because that is the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. The apostate church, the harlot church, will always follow the zeitgeist. Today, you have the stage being set for Antichrist, the coming of Babylon the Great that will be his footstool. You have the false religions of the world quasi-uniting. This is what took place with the pontifical religions in the first century under the Roman emperors. Now it's come back again <clears throat> under the guise of the papacy and other such institutions. Interfaith religion, under the guise of 
the zeitgeist. That is to say, multiculturalism. Multiculturalism encompassing interfaith worship. It's the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. No matter what the zeitgeist is, however, the spirit on back of the spirit of the age is always the devil. The world is in the power of the wicked one. It's always Satan. He may be operating through and by means of various philosophical trends and pseudo-spiritual paradigms, but ultimately it's always his hand. As I've said many times, as the Holy Spirit is preparing the faithful church for the coming of Christ, the spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist, as the New Testament calls it, is preparing the way for the coming of the Antichrist. And as always, Satan is working through the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. Social engineering always derives from the zeitgeist. Always derives from the zeitgeist. Let's take one example. Let's look at our school systems. The United States spends more on education per child than any other country in the world. More on education. But it has some of the lowest results. Countries that spend far less per capita per student, such as Singapore and Finland, get far better results. Far better. Why? The American school system is not designed to educate. It's designed to socially engineer children on the basis of the zeitgeist to conform to the spirit of the age, to be politically correct, to accept multiculturalism, to accept interfaith, to accept the normalcy of sexual abnormality in the areas of homosexuality, to accept abortion despite the medical evidence that it is in fact infanticide when it is, when it is performed without any medical or clinical warrant. It's based on conditioning. It's not based on educating. It's based on conditioning. The educational system is primarily not there to teach children to think. It's there to teach them how not to think, or at least not to think outside the box determined by the powers that be. It's propaganda. It's not education. It's conditioning. It's not really there for learning, other than to conform to some ideal. The teachers' unions, certainly in the United States, Great Britain is no different, but in the United States, the teachers' union is a political campaign fund for the Democratic Party. That's what it is. One-third of the teachers in the United States, one-third of the teachers in the United States uh, come from like the lowest 20% of the graduating class. They're not as well selected as they are in countries with better results like Singapore. In the United States, due to financial motives in part, not just social status, medicine, dentistry, and law tend to attract the best and brightest, as do high-tech fields. In Singapore, a teacher has the same social status as a lawyer or a physician. It's a desired position, but it's a competitive position. You just can't become a teacher. There's people who become teachers because... They get three months a year vacation with pay, a good benefit package, and a subsidized university or college level education. It can be a very good deal. Not only that, but in non-scientific fields particularly, those who can't do teach. If you're not good enough to make it on Wall Street, become an economics professor. If you're no good in the pulpit, become a theology professor at, at, at Yale Divinity School. Those who can't do, teach. If you're no good in court, become a law professor. Uh, there are exceptions, like Alan Dershowitz was, but they are only exceptions. Those who can't do, teach. Because it's not about doing. It's about conditioning. It's not about educating. It's about programming. It's not about grooming students to think. It's about grooming them not to think, or only to think what you want them to think. It's a big mess. It's social engineering. But on back of it is a spirit, the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. And on back of that is Satan. Yes, it is setting the stage for Antichrist. 
It has always been an instrument in Satan's hands, but now it really is. Uh, a worse example would be the Roman Catholic school system, which was designed to stop the spread of, of, of evangelicism and Protestantism after the Reformation. Give us a child to the age of seven and he's ours for life. That's the way it works. It's always an agenda. And the agenda is not God's. It is setting the stage for the man of lawlessness. Yes. Believers need to think outside of man's box. And the only way to think outside of man's box is to get into God's box. Thank you so much for your question. My name is Jacob Pash. God bless. Okay. If you have not seen a person in 40 years, didn't recognize them at all, and then were told who they were and you recognized them, then you'd begin to make contact references to what they used to look like and realize it was the same person. Something like that overtook the apostles. This is the reason. Jesus had no sin but he came in the likeness of sinful flesh to take our sin. Once he died in our place as a sinless sacrifice, taking our sin on himself, entered eternity and then came back to life. His body was the same body, but it was Adamic. Adamic. What bodies would have been like had man not fallen. And it's a illustration, or not just an illustration, it is a representation of what our bodies are going to be like in the millennial reign of Christ. Our bodies in the millennial reign are going to be his. Now notice, he still had the pierce marks. I've graven you on my hand. Those things will always be there. All of our imperfections are gone. Your imperfections are gone. My imperfections will be gone in the millennial reign of Christ in a resurrected body. It will be the same body, but it won't look the same. It will look perfectly healthy. As beautiful as a baby is when it's born, as beautiful as a small child is, as beautiful as a bride is on her wedding day, come back 50 years later. <laughs> uh, the resurrected bodies won't be like that. They're not going to be subject to to bioentropy. Well, what happened to Jesus, he's the prototype of that. It'll be the same body protoplasmically in its atomic, in its, in its elemental constituency, but it will not look the same. Much the same as if you renovate a building. it make it look better or you restore it to its state before it became dilapidated and you don't recognize it. Well, that's the way it's going to be. One exception even in the millennium, Jesus is going to show us the radius on his right and on his left. Not the metacarpal, the radius. This is how much I love you. He's going to bear those one marks of his original body before it rose from the dead. He'll always wear those things so we will know how much he loved us and what he did for us, and that our bodies are not going to become old and sick and ragged again because he died our death to give us his life. That is the reason. Uh, now, this question goes further into the issue of don't touch me, I've not yet ascended to my father. That is another matter. Uh, I'm not going to answer it because it's not your specific question, but bearing in mind the answer to your question leads to another question, which would be that one. So, in essence, a resurrected body is a restoration of the Adamic body. In other words, the way you and I look now, that's not what we were supposed to look like. Because the way we look now, the features will change with age. We will lose our attractiveness with age. We were supposed to look different from the beginning and have a body that doesn't age or become ill, etc., etc., that won't be affected by entropy. Well, the resurrected Jesus is the prototype of that. I trust that explains why 
they didn't recognize him at first, and it helps us understand the nature of a resurrected body and its importance and what that will mean in the millennial reign of Christ. Thank you for your question. My name is Jacob Pash. God bless. Thank you for your question, and it is an important one. Let's begin with the age of accountability. That varies from individual to individual. If you are a parent to whom God has given a Down syndrome child, that child may never reach the age of accountability. Now the Lord has placed a tremendous responsibility and a tremendous burden requiring a tremendous amount of love on you to parent a Down's child. But with that, with that burden, with that challenge, with that responsibility, he's also given you a blessing. You know that the Lord will not take that child's sin into account because they really don't know what they're doing. You are, in a sense, given a guarantee of that child's salvation that other people don't have. Whenever the Lord allows a cross like that, he helps you carry it. He gives a blessing that comes with it. Uh, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing to say, but I would much rather have had a Down's child that I know is going to be with Jesus than to have a child who grows up in the truth, backslides, gets into the world, turns against Christ and dies outside of the faith and enters eternity under the judgment of God, I'd much rather be in your position. Now that is not to make light of your position by any means. God bless you. May the Lord give you the grace and the strength and everything you need to love and take care of that Down's child. But in the end game, you're a winner. You're a assured winner. You're the horse that can't lose the race. The Lord does not take the sin into account. The age of accountability can vary. Some child, one child will be younger than another. It varies. Now let's understand this even further. We see that God sent bears to devour children who were being wicked towards the prophet Elisha, tormenting an old man. Uh, they were obviously accountable. They were obviously accountable. There's also a sense in Scripture where there are ages of maturity, 20 being one. Somebody could not serve in the army of Israel until the age of 20 in Scripture. Jesus and David began their reign as kings or as public ministry of Jesus at, in the age of, of, of their 30s. There are significant ages. Bar Mitzvah age, 12, 13 being another. We see the Bar Mitzvah age of Jesus. It's about time I've been about my father's business. Rites of passage. Accountability is not all at once. It comes in stages. It comes in phases. But certainly by the time somebody is grown up, they should understand everything they need to understand. Remember, the boys were devoured by the bears. They knew what they were doing in that case was wrong. Okay. Well, let's go further with this now. Although the age of accountability can vary, children, particularly those who grow up in Christian families and have one, at least one Christian parent, may indeed be able to come to an understanding of their need for salvation and have a relationship with Jesus at a very young age, as you say, six or something like that. My daughter was six when she got baptized. Let's look at the second issue now. When a child grows up in a believing family, and the bedtime stories are always from the Bible, Mary and Martha and David and Goliath, and they go to Sunday school, and they sing, Yes, Jesus loves me, and he died for me, and they say, pray the sinner's prayer at the youth camp for the little kids and all that stuff. You cannot always say at what point the child was born again. You cannot always say. You can lead them to the Lord and say the prayer with them, and they can mean it, but they may have already been saved ahead of time. They may have already been saved by that time. When a little kid grows up in it, 
you can't always determine when second birth happens. It can happen quite naturally in a committed Christian family. But what you can put your finger on, the date, the time, the place you can put your finger on, is baptism, the funeral. <laughs> okay, the funeral, the baptism. They can put their finger on that. Dead and buried, okay, believed and is baptized. Well, how long do you wait to bury a corpse? Once a child is old enough to understand the gospel, that they have sinned, that Jesus died in their place, that he was God who came to save them, and they have to ask him into their heart and ask him to save them and make them born again and empower them to live a holy life and give them his spirit. Once that happens, well, how long do you wait to, to have a funeral when somebody dies? If a child can understand those things, it won't be too long before they can understand baptism. This is a picture now, little Janie. This is a picture now, you know, little Frankie. When they go under the water, they're co-buried with him. When they come out, they're co-resurrected. You see, you don't have to worry about a funeral because when you go under, that's your funeral. You died with Jesus, but when you come out, you're a new creation that lives forever because of what Jesus did. You can explain it to little kids in those terms. You don't have to give them the sophisticated theology. You just have to let them understand the practical realities of death and burial. Those things can happen at the same age as salvation. How long do you wait to bury a corpse and to bring it up out of the water again? If they're old enough to understand the gospel and get saved, they're old enough to get baptized. They can understand the one, they can understand the second. There's no reason to delay it. Not only that, once they have been baptized, there's no reason to withhold the Lord's Supper from them. Do not give the Lord's Supper to unbaptized children, but once they have come to faith, they can become communicants. They're welcome to a place at the marriage supper of the Lamb, the same as all of us. They can take the Lord's Supper. You don't send them out. Let them be there and take the communion. Um, that's the scriptural principles. Those are the scriptural principles. Now, again, it's fine to pray with a child and lead them to Christ. And when you have a baptism for them, to go through it. Do you believe that Jesus died in your place? And tell me what Jesus means to you, Janie. Tell me what Jesus means to you, Reuben. And they'll tell you. Let them give their testimony. Don't intimidate them with a lot of adults around. Make it very nice, you know, and not, not intimidating. But ask them the questions. Let them testify. Make sure they understand it. Then do the baptism. That's the way it should be done. The complication is always going to be, one, we do not know the age of specific accountability. It can vary from child to child. And two, a child who grows up in a believing family may already be saved. They may already be born again. They may already have a relationship with Jesus. They just may not understand it doctrinally or intellectually, but the relationship is there. We can't assume that they're not already believers. <laughs> they may have a relationship. But what you can do is take them through the ordinance of baptism and confirm it and affirm it in the presence of the church and the presence of the Lord and the devil and the witnesses and the world. Baptism becomes highly important in the case of a child growing up in a Christian family. I hope that helps sort out what is a rather important, but also not uncomplicated question. And we do thank you for asking it. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless. Thank you.
Thank you so much for your question, and it is indeed a good one. We've addressed this issue in the past, but perhaps it's time to refocus on it momentarily in response to your question. When you see people like bin Laden, the late bin Laden, or his son now, or Al-Qaeda, or ISIS, being described in the popular media, in the mainstream press, as radical Muslims, and I refer to them that way myself, or as radical Islam, understand it's not radical Islam. It's simply Islam. When you read the Hadith, when you read the history of Muhammad and what he did, and the teachings of the Quran, they're simply following the teachings of Muhammad literally. They're doing the things Muhammad did. So while we can call it radical Islam, in fact, it's simply Islam. Now, is there moderate Islam? No. But there are moderate Muslims who take a more liberal and modern view of the Quran and the Hadith, who see jihad as a moral struggle with oneself, shifting emphasis away from jihad as spreading Islam by the sword. There are moderate Muslims who will say some of the statutes of Sharia concerning women and homosexuals and things of this nature only apply to the ancient world. They do not apply now legally. They're only broad moral guides or something of that nature. You'll find Muslims saying that. Not least of all, I would say most of all, there are Islamic academics, Muslim scholars in the West called Orientalists who are the only truly credible scholars of Islam. You will not find Orientalists at al Azra University in Cairo or in Saudi Arabia or Iran. They would be killed. These are the true scholars who take an objective, critical, academic look at Islam from the point of view of history, archaeology, manuscript history, etc. And they basically demythologize much of the Quran based on facts. These are the true scholars of Islam, the Orientalists. These people can be described as moderates. There are organizations in the United States consisting of moderate Muslims who want to modernize it, who do not think that all the provisions of Sharia apply in the non-Muslim world and do not even apply in the Muslim world in the way or to the degree they did in the time of Muhammad. So yes, there are moderate Muslims. But moderate Islam? Difficult to define that. When people like Al-Qaeda and ISIS claim they're only following the teachings of their prophet Muhammad, they're telling the truth. They're not lying. People like George Bush lied when he said these people are distorting Islam. People like Barack Obama lied when he says things like these people are distorting the true teachings of the prophet, meaning Muhammad. He's not the prophet. They lied. Bin Laden told the truth. He was just following what Muhammad taught and did. He was following the example, the Mohammedan example. Islam should not be called Islam. It should probably be called Mohammedism. Talmudic Judaism today should not be called Judaism. It is not Levitical Judaism of Moses. What's called Judaism today should better be called, the more accurately be called, Rabbinism. Rabbinism. It's based on Halakha. It's based on Jewish law. So Islam is better called Mohammedism. It's based on Sharia, Islamic law. Roman Catholicism should not be called Christianity. It should rather be called what it is. 
the pontifical religions of, of Rome. It's what it always was from the times of the emperors. It is pontifical. It's not Christian. They all claim to be something. Well, Islam can claim to be a religion of peace and moderation. I always go back to the same response. If what you say is true of the 57 Muslim nations in the world, please, sir, please, madam, show me even one that will give Christians and Jews the rights Muslims have in the United States, in Great Britain, in France, in Canada, in Australia. Show me one of those 57 countries. You can't show me one because there isn't one. No, there is no moderate Islam. There are only moderate Muslims. And they, viewed globally, are a probable minority. A probable minority. It is more likely that upwards of 50% of the world's Muslims are fundamentalists. And somewhere ranking 25%, which is hundreds of millions, are jihadists. That is, they are either terrorists or they're sympathetic to terror. You're talking about hundreds of millions of people. This notion, it's only a small handful of radicals, this is a lie. I always remember when I was 12 years old here in New York City, watching on television, a guy called Alan Burke who had a discussion show, late night TV. And he had different guests, authors usually, different people. And once he had the Nazi hunter, um, Hein Weisenthal. Incredible man. And I watched Mr. Weisenthal. And one of the questions asked on this broadcast of Mr. Weisenthal was, were all Germans Nazis? And he just laughed. And he said, no. No more than 15% at most, and probably not that many. It only took 15% of the population of a civilized country like Germany to do what the Nazis did in the Holocaust and the Blitz. My apologies to those who heard me say this before. If you look at the Muslim world, even Muslims living in the West, at least 30%, and globally, upwards of 50% are fundamentalists. Are people who believe that Sharia should be imposed. That's much higher than the percentage of Germans that were Nazis. Islam is a diabolical threat to human civilization. If 15% of the Germans in a civilized country can cause the Blitz and the Holocaust, what can 30 to 50 percent of fundamentalist Muslims in a largely uncivilized sphere of the world? Muslim countries can be quite barbaric. Uh, what will the fruit of that be? Many people believe, going back to the Puritans, that this army of locust invaders with the faces of men that we see unleashed in the book of Revelation chapter 8 that it's Islam that, it, that, it's, that it's Islam they may very well be correct that this army from the book of Joel that appears in the book of Revelation is Islam they may very well be correct in the time of Joel they came from Babylon they came from the East, from the Islamic nations. It could be the same again. This goes back to the 16th century when evangelicals began to believe this. Again. Moderate Muslims? Yes. Moderate Islam? It really doesn't exist. Thank you so much for your question. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless you. In the Old Testament... <coughs> We have two possible etymological roots for Zion. 
One would be related to the term fortress, as in a fortress city or fortified city. And the other is lifted up. It had an ambiguous meaning in the Old Testament, depending on the context. It first appears in the book of Samuel. It could refer to a fortified city, the fortified city, the original Jebusite city conquered by David. But it could also refer to Harzi on the mountain above it. The fortified city of David, or the city of David as it is today, has the Kidron Valley on one side, the Valley of Hinnom on the south, and the Tyropean Valley on the west, going around it sort of like a U, <coughs> a slanted U. On the north side, however, there is Mount Zion, about 105 feet above the Tyropean Valley on the west. So it depends if it's talking about the city or the mountain, but sometimes it's a composite term meaning both. Now what does it mean spiritually in the New Testament? Turn with me if you will please to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12. In verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. Notice it's both the mountain and the city. Now again, one is the idea of being lifted up, and the other is the idea of fortification. The mountain is the lifting up, Mount Zion on the sides of the north, okay? Or the elevations of the north. The city of the great king. So the mountain is the lifting up, but the city is the strong city. Its strength is that it's in the shadow of God. Its strength is the fact that it's in the shadow of God towering above it on the north. So you see the compound Old Testament usage both included in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. And we continue to read the heavenly Jerusalem and to the myriads of angels. Well, what is this Heavenly Jerusalem, the ultimate meaning. Look with me, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 21. Now, again, Hebrews is drawing largely from the book of Isaiah. But our concern is the New Testament interpretation of what Zion is and what it means. Revelation, chapter 21, verse 9, says, Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven vials filled of the last seven plagues, came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. So now the city is identified as a bride, adorned for her husband. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the holy city. Notice again, you've got the city and the mountain together. Coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, her brilliance was like a very costly stone, a stone of crystal clear jasper. Now the word city in Hebrew is ir, ir, which is not feminine. But here it is referred to as feminine and called a bride. It was literal Jerusalem and the Temple Mount above it. Mount Zion, the city of Zion, okay, or taken in composite with each other. Two aspects of the same Zion. Isaiah alludes prophetically and typologically to the New Testament meaning repeatedly, even in Isaiah 52. But when we get to the New Testament, we see what it is. It is the ultimate bride of God. Yahweh will not ultimately have two women. Israel being the wife of Jehovah, the church being the bride of Christ. Ultimately, they will not be two women. Ultimately, they will not be two. They will be one. They will ultimately be one. And the name will be called Zion. But notice it is not speaking of a woman biologically. It's speaking of a city 
under the shadow of the great king that's lifted up above us. That is the spiritual meaning of Zion. It is the ultimate, ultimate bride, the wife of the Lamb, that is inclusive of both faithful Israel and the faithful church, joined into one ultimate and eternal entity. That is the meaning of Zion in the New Testament. Zion is the name, as it were, of the inclusive bride of Christ. Not just Israel as the bride of Jehovah, not just the church as the bride of Christ, but a corporate bride. Yet, not in the sense of a marital relationship biologically, but with the bride is compared to a city. Now, to understand this, it stands in juxtaposition and contrast to what precedes it. What precedes it is, of course, the bride of the Antichrist, Babylon the Great, the great harlot, the woman on the hills and so forth. Mount Zion and Zion and the city of Zion, that city, that mountain, stands in contrast, in juxtaposition, and in opposition to Babylon the Great in Revelation chapters 17 and 18. Just as literal Jerusalem and Mount Zion, the Temple Mount, prefigure the spiritual Zion of the book of Revelation, spoken of in the epistle to the Hebrews, so too the ancient city of Babylon, and going back to the Tower of Babel, prefigure Babylon the Great. So the Babylonian city capital of the Babylonian Empire is a picture of Babylon the Great while Zion Jerusalem the Temple Mount is a picture of the ultimate final Zion that is the bride of the Lamb in the book of Revelation the two have to be viewed in contrast Satan attempts to set up his counterfeit bride his counterfeit city as it were Notice in both motifs, both in Revelation 18, speaking of the wicked city, the harlot city, it describes her as a wicked woman. So, the faithful city is described as the faithful bride. One of Christ, the other of Antichrist. That is how, in essence, we need to understand Zion. Thank you so much for your question. This is Jacob Pash coming to you from Israel today. God bless you.